In this follow-up reflection on session four on argument evaluation and peer review, I am going to revisit some of the points I made in the lecture that you can watch on YouTube. I will offer a couple of extensions and then in this one, I'll, I'll give you some guidance and recommendations. Based on largely what I saw as I served as the editor-in-chief, but also I'll be drawing upon my experiences as an author and a reviewer. And some of the recommendations or some of the things I want to talk about are linked to the problems and misunderstandings that I have seen from especially junior scholars who are becoming members of the journal communities. Sometimes young scholars I think it's probably inadvertent, but they may come across as arrogant and unprofessional. And I think a lot of that may have to do with the fact that they don't fully appreciate and understand what these review processes are about, how much time reviewers and editors put into these processes, and so on. And I also really want to emphasize that there are no incentives of any kind for anyone to reject articles. Just the opposite. Every editor I know looks for more good manuscripts to publish. So the idea that the editors or reviewers would be out there to get you, that simply isn't the case. I really want to focus on those issues where I've seen these kinds of misunderstandings, and I'll try to give some explicit guidance in this reflection. My reflections in this recording are based on my experience as an editor-in-chief of Journal of Operations Management, but I'm also going to go back to the Toolman model and the appendix in my 21 article with Saku Mantere. In that appendix, we make a couple observations about how the Toolman model could help the peer review process, how it could help both reviewers and authors make their positions and especially disagreement more transparent and explicit. Let's say that the author and a reviewer disagree on something. Well, do you disagree on the grounds, on the empirical material, or do you disagree on the claim or the qualifier or the choice of warrants or the backings? If we can just pinpoint where the disagreement is, that can all already be very helpful in solving potential issues with the manuscript. I'm going to make a total of eight observations slash recommendations about the review process. And these are aimed specifically at new scholars who are becoming members of journals as communities and kind of are tr uh, trying to learn the ropes and the basic rules and procedures. The first one, which I already mentioned in my lecture, always include a cover letter with your manuscript. Again, when I was editor, we would get a manuscript uh, with a cover letter only about 50% of the time. That really should be 100%. In the cover letter, this is your opportunity as an author to communicate to th those who handle your manuscript, the editor-in-chief or a senior editor who make the ultimate decision, this is your opportunity to show them that you know what the aims and the scope of the journal are and that you're able to position your work within that scope. So your task in the cover letter that should be about one page long is not to start evaluating your own work or try to argue that it makes an important contribution. This is something to be determined in the review process. In the cover letter, you want to establish how your manuscript links to relevant conversations that are within the scope of the journal. This is the key task for you in writing the cover letter. 
and it helps the editor first of all see that your manuscript is within the scope of the journal but in case the journal has a departmental structure it also helps the editor send it to the right department so in the cover letter just tell very concisely what your paper is about and why you think it provides a good fit for the journal now if you get a revise and resubmit request this is something that has always worked for me as you're trying to think of well how do how do i rewrite what kinds of edits revisions do i have to make something that works for me really well is i don't touch the manuscript itself until i have written up the response to reviews document because once that's written up and once I have at least a draft of a point by point response to all the concerns, it's then easier for me to go and start revising the manuscript itself. So instead of starting to rewrite directly, write the response document first. And then when you resubmit and the response document could be a very long document. I've had, uh, because I copy paste all the reviews to this document and then I write a point by point response. Sometimes those documents have been 20 to 25 pages single spaced. I can't think of editors or reviewers who would object to that. When they see that, hey, these authors have really taken my concerns seriously. I see a point by point response to every single concern that I presented. That is a strong signal of credibility. But do summarize the key revisions in the cover letter for the revision. And again, keep it concise. A one pager is usually uh, when I was an editor and I would see several hundred cover letters. It, it was always nice when I could see just the, the one pager. I said, okay, this is what the authors are trying to tell me and it doesn't say page one out of five. So it, it really uh, try to make your points as concisely as possible. There's going to be disagreement. You may disagree with a reviewer when that happens, take a time out and make sure that you understand very clearly where and how the reviewers disagree. And I think this is where the Toolman model can be useful in pinpointing where exactly the disagreement is. If it's in the grounds, in the claim, in the qualifiers, this can really help you communicate more efficiently with the reviewers and with the editorial team. And again, it's okay to disagree, do it respectfully and do it transparently. And if the disagreement is on a matter of choice, and again, where in the Toolman model do we see authors making choices, mostly in the warrants and in the backings. The choice situations are the most challenging ones to tackle. And I think that there are choices that should be the prerogative of the authors, but then there are choices that are in fact the prerogative of the editor or those who make decisions. Anything that relates to journal policy is the prerogative of the editor. So if the disagreement is on a point of policy, then you as an author should be very careful in, in challenging that. I would sometimes be challenged on a rejection decision that I made because I thought that the manuscript was not within the scope of the journal. And I remember a couple times the author would come back and say, no, I disagree. Uh, here's a, an excerpt from the Ames and Scope, and I don't do this. 
If I as an editor tell you that your manuscript is out of scope, then by definition it is out of scope. Editorial policy is my prerogative. So if you disagree, that's just um, something that you have to deal with. Do not challenge editors on editorial policy. Nothing good can come out of that. And finally, I didn't have time to talk about this in the lecture, but it is in the recording. Um, you will see when you get reviews on your manuscript that reviewers disagree, that one reviewer may recommend rejection, another may recommend a minor revision, and yet another may recommend a major revision. I would caution against interpreting this as inconsistency in the reviews. And why am I saying that? When reviewers disagree, let's say one reviewer recommends rejection and another a minor revision, they usually disagree on different things. And this is because when the editors send your work out to review, they do not send it to three or four identical people. They will deliberately pick someone who's an ex expert on the theory part, someone who is an expert on methodology and so on. So when the reviews are equivocal, there are differences in the reviews. It's not because the reviewers disagree with one another. They just see different parts of the manuscript. The person who looks at your methodology focuses on methodological concerns and so on. So this is why disagreement and inconsistency are not synonymous. I'm trying to think of experiences as an author and as a reviewer and editor where two reviewers of the same manuscript would have looked at the exact same thing and one would have said, oh, this is great, and the other would have said, oh, this is, this is a cause for concern. So when there's disagreement, they're usually focusing on different aspects of the manuscript. So that's why I don't worry about this inconsistency of reviews as much as some of my colleagues do. Fifth, if and when you get a rejection, the, the knee-jerk reaction is to challenge the editorial decision. And I feel this temptation every time I get a rejection. But I decided about 13 years ago that I will not challenge an editorial decision. The editorial decision is always the editorial team's prerogative. No matter how much I disagree, it is not my time and my place to challenge the decision. And in fact, when I was the editor, I would get numerous emails from rejected authors who wanted to know more. They wanted to get more details. And my boilerplate response, which I just copy pasted to my uh, reply to the email was, I know you're disappointed, but the editorial team has told you everything they want to tell you in the decision letter that you got. I understand the disappointment, but don't go after the editors. Don't go after the reviewers. Nothing good can come out of that. And this relates to my, my next point. It, when, when you get critical reviews, and let's say someone's even nasty in their review, don't think that they're out there to get you. First of all, peer review is participation. So if I'm reviewing a manuscript, I usually take one full day out of my busy schedule to review the manuscript. Why would I do it if my motivation was to, to get you. I, I don't know who you are. So this idea that there would be some kind of a twisted incentive in the review process, you know, to get you as an author. 
No, this is not how the system works. We all do this on a voluntary basis. Some of us have a more, I don't want to say aggressive, but more direct, candid way of giving negative feedback. And I have gotten very strongly worded reviews where my first reaction has been, oh, this person is just a jerk. But then when I read the entire review, and I remember this one review that was 13 pages long, single spaced. And I said, okay, maybe I don't like the way this person is communicating, but they have taken a very good look at my manuscript and they're actually making very valid points. Their, their style is just something that, that I don't appreciate, but I appreciate the time that they have put into the process. So don't think that reviewers and editors are out there to get you. They aren't. And I never vent my frustrations in public. I get rejected all the time. And I get emotional about it first. I go for a long run. I try to think of what's going on. Have there been misunderstandings? But ultimately, if I'm going to blame someone for the rejection, the only person I'm going to blame is myself. Well, I don't blame myself, but I, I look at the reviews, I look at the manuscript and I say, what's going on? What, what can I do differently? Okay, I want to find a home for this manuscript. What is it that I need to do? And let me tell you that going on LinkedIn and venting my frustration in public isn't going to help me. I think it's also unprofessional and unethical to publish any part of the decision letter or the reviews on platforms like LinkedIn. I mean, the documents are not confidential, but they are not meant to be published either. If you ask any editor if it would be okay for you to publish the decision letter or any part of it, my prediction is that just about every editor would say, no, this letter is meant for you, not to the public. And nobody knows what's really happened in the process. So if you're venting in public, you're essentially accusing someone without really giving them a chance to defend themselves. Because if they came out to defend themselves, they would have to violate the principle of double blind. They would have to identify themselves. So please don't vent your frustrations in public. Find other ways of coping with rejections. This has happened to me a couple times with two journals. I simply had repeated bad experiences with the journal. And I said, you know what? I'm going to walk away from this journal at this point. There are so many journals out there. I mean, we have to publish. We have to publish in peer reviewed journals. But there are so many options out there that you're ultimately not dependent on any individual journal. So if you have repeated bad experiences, you know, just walk away, just walk away. Just say, this isn't worth my time and, and just find other outlets. These two journals that I walked away from, I never looked back. I never re regret it. And then when I received review requests from these journals, I would just politely respond to the request saying, um, I'm sorry, I, I only review for journals to which I send my own work and I don't send my work to your journal, therefore I, I politely decline from reviewing. And that was the last thing I ever heard from those journals. So you're not hostages of any, any single journal. So don't, don't think that you have to bend over backwards and, and take repeated, I, I'm, I emphasize repeated bad experiences. I've had a bad experience with every journal I've ever published in. But if you start seeing a pattern, then there could be something 
um, in the journal, its structure, the way it's managed, that, that simply is out of whack. You know that there are predatory journals. There are academic journals that where the, the main objective is simply to make money. I never submit anything to an academic journal that charges me upon the decision to publish. If publication is contingent upon me paying several thousand euros just to get my work published, then that's not a journal I want to be uh, affiliated with in any way, neither as an author nor a reviewer. I'm not saying that publication fees immediately indicate that it's a predatory journal, but sizable publication fees are a red flag to me, and I will walk away from any journal that does that. This concludes my follow-up reflection on argument evaluation and peer review.